Welcome everyone. We are going to start our discussion on biodiversity today. So we are going to split biodiversity into three lectures because obviously there's so much life in this world. So today we're just going to focus on um, just what diversity is and we're going to start with prokaryotes today. So bacteria, archaea, those guys. So today we're going to talk about how do we classify organisms, right? So what do we call it? How do we split them all up? And so some of it will be a little bit of review, but um, what's specific to um, biodiversity? And then we're going to discuss a little bit about phylogeny or the tree of life. And that's a way we um, classify and structure uh, organisms and how they're related. And then we'll get into our prokaryotes. So how do we classify all of these organisms of the world, right? We have so many of them. Um, how do we talk about them? How do we classify them? What are their relationships to each other? So really we place them in categories based on their evolutionary relationship, meaning do they have a common ancestor and what is their common ancestor? And so we call this way of organization a phylogeny or a family tree. And this is very specific to their relationship in evolutionary history. So for example, on the bottom left, we have a phylogenic tree. So this would be a family tree. It's very similar kind of to what you see um, in a family tree for a human, right? So you create a family tree with the parents and the children, but this is a little bit different in terms of their common ancestor instead of their parentage, right? So it's gonna be their evolutionary common ancestor before they evolved and split into different species, okay? Uh, for example, right, we have the manatee and the elephant over here on the right. You may say, okay, well, one is a uh, land mammal and one is a um, water mammal, right? So they are actually very distantly related. Um, a lot of people refer to manatees as the elephants of the sea. So there you go. But they are related, okay? So it's it lets it allows us to... Um, you know, pair up these animals and compare them uh, via their evolutionary relationship. So here's just another example, right? So obviously we have um, two mammals on the left-hand side, so they are going to share a common ancestor, whereas <clears throat> the, each one is not going to really share a specific common ancestor with a plant, but all mammals are going to share a um, a very distant common ancestor with a plant. So we would create our phylogeny like this, where our, um, our, our two mammals on the left-hand side are going to have a common ancestor, right? And then that common ancestor will have a common ancestor with the plant as well. And so you can build these very distant uh, evolutionary relationships using uh, this phylogeny system. So we have to be careful when we compare organisms, right? So generally when we're talking about organisms that share similar morphologies, they're likely to be more closely related. Um, and what do we mean by morphologies, right? So if we look at our two um, animals at the bottom of the screen, we have a whale on the left and a shark on the right. Whereas you may say, yes, they have fins um, and they have similar morphologies. They must be closely related. But we have to remember about convergent evolution. So remember we talked about divergent versus convergent evolution. And convergent means that there's a resemblance between the two species because of their environments and they've now adapted uh, to their environments which has driven uh, the similar morphologies but they're not uh, related at all, right? So again, we can talk a lot about different things, right? Body shape, or we've talked about wings. Um, so things like that, uh, that are due to maybe convergent evolution and not divergent. Divergent is where they share a similar uh, 
common ancestor, right? So now we're going to talk a little bit about taxonomy and it's definitely a hierarchical classification. So meaning that each taxonomical level is more general than the one below it, right? So when we talk about a domain, right, which is our highest taxonomical level, it's going to be the most general, right? Because all of these things across the table are all considered in the domain eukarya, right? But obviously a sunflower is very different from a chimpanzee. So as you go down that taxonomical level into kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, and finally species, you're going to get more and more general. And so you, that more evolutionarily closer related species are then going to be grouped closer and closer together, right? So we get more and more specific as we go down each level. Okay, so it's a way of um, classifying organisms in a hierarchical manner due to their um, ancestry. Okay, so taxonomy, right? So, what is taxonomy? And it's really the science of describing, naming, and classifying organisms, right? So, we have these levels of taxonomy. And we just said that um, each level gets more and more specific or as you go out more and more general, right? So we use traits to classify organisms that show relationships, okay? So if we look at this example here, what are some good traits you might use? So these are two uh, flowering uh, plants, right? And you may say, okay, well, their flowers look somewhat similar, right? But the groupings of the flowers are a little bit different. The colors are different. Maybe the leaves are similar. So you can pick different traits to use uh, to create your um, classifications. So once we get down to the more specific levels of our taxonomy, right, our lowest levels that are most related, uh, we use a binomial nomenclature. So this is a system of naming our organisms based on a unique two-part name, okay? So what does that mean? Well, the first part is going to be the genus. Okay, for example, if we're talking about humans, right, we are the genus Homo. And then the second part is going to be our species, right, so our specific descriptive phrase. And so we are sapiens, right, Homo sapiens. So it's a two-part name or binomial nomenclature. So we have our example of our corn down here as well. So a lot of people don't know what the um, scientific name of corn is, and that's Zia maize. Okay, so Zia would be the genus, and maize would be the species. Okay, and then on our next slide, we've got some salvia species as well. Okay. So here are some of these different salvia. So salvia would be the genus. And so then we have some different species of salvia. Okay. So our left two pictures where there's those first two uh, pictures we talked about, right? What are some different traits that we're looking at, right? So these guys all have kind of similar looking flower types, but maybe different colors, right? So white versus purple sage. And then we have chia up on the top right, which looks very similar to black sage, right? But maybe different color, um, but their uh, flowers are kind of arranged very similarly. So again, uh, and again, the common name for a lot of these are sage, but their technical genus is salvia, okay? And so then we have the different species that are very specific, um, the specific traits of that species, okay? So just some examples, right, of our, how we use uh, binomial nomenclature. So now we actually use those traits and characteristics to construct our phylogenic trees, okay? So 
If they share a trait or common characteristic, then they're going to go closer together on our tree, right? So when we pick characteristics that distinguish the differences between uh, the species. So for example, on our bottom left are, are going to be our characteristics on the y-axis and our taxa, right, or our organisms on uh, the x-axis. And then we're going to create our phylogeny on the right hand side using these different characteristics, right? So for our first characteristic, it's going to be amnion, right? So if they share an amnion, then they're going to be on the, the a branch altogether, okay? But if they don't have an amnion, they're going to be separated, and that's going to be our little frog friend, right? So then for our next branch, we're going to say, do they have hair and mammary glands, right? So do they have hair and mammary glands? They're going to be on one side if they do. If they don't, such as the iguana, we can put him out on his own branch, okay? And then we can keep going down, right? So do they have a gestation length? Do they have a pregnancy length, right? So if they do, then they're going to be together as well, okay? But we do not have a gestation, right? So gestation is carried um, in a uterus, right, to a certain degree, whereas our black duck billed platypus does not have a gestation. They lay eggs, right? So those guys are going to be on their own. And then do they have a long gestation finally, right? So long could depend on, you know, the length that it doesn't really matter, but longer gestation is going to be on its own, whereas that's the beaver versus the kangaroo. So the beaver has a longer gestation uh, period than the kangaroo. Okay, so that's how we actually create a phylogenic tree and you can use different traits, right, and characteristics to create your different phylogenies, okay. So that means on this that the kangaroo and the beaver are more closely related than the beaver and say the iguana, right, or even the platypus, okay. So far we've been just kind of talking about characteristics and traits that we can see or maybe are anatomical. But what about our molecular uh, relatedness, right? What about our DNA? So now that we know more about the DNA and the genomes of different species, we can actually use that information to infer the relatedness between species. So now we can maybe change some of our phylogenies uh, if we have some DNA evidence that has revealed that some groups maybe are more genetically similar or different than once we thought before, right? So maybe they don't really share any sort of um, anatomical or morphological characteristics. But if you look at their DNA, they may be more similar than we uh, previously thought. Okay. For example, when we were looking at the DNA of a rock hyrax and an elephant, we actually found out that they are related, whereas you may not have thought that at first glance. Here's a smaller rodent type looking creature and you have a very large land mammal um, in the elephant, right? So very different species, but they do have a common ancestor um, that we may not have thought of before looking at their DNA. So now let's look at the tree of life, right? So this is a current accepted classification system um, where we are talking about three different domains. So again, domains are the most general taxonomical level, right? So we have three domains, and that's going to be bacteria, archaea, which those are more closely related than our eukarya, okay? But again, we're all saying that they have a very distant common ancestor. So we're going to spend most of our time today uh, talking about bacteria and archaea, which are considered prokaryotes. 
and then we have our eukarya, which are eukaryotes, right? And there is a very good link here uh, that I will post on Canvas as well, but you can go to that link and it gives you a really good idea of these different domains and you can um, look at the different uh, kingdoms and phylums and things like that within uh, the Tree of Life link. So again, we've got our three most general domains, right? And that's going to be our bacteria, archaea, and eukarya. And so then within that, within the eukarya domain, we actually have three kingdoms, okay? So that's going to be our plants, our fungi, and our animals. But if you notice, we have this other little group here called a protist or protista. So protista is not considered a kingdom, it's considered a group. So we'll talk a lot more about protists in our next lecture. They're very cool, um, but they do share some similarities between plants, uh, fungi, and animals. So you can't quite give them their own kingdom, but we'll talk about what we, how we actually classify them. So protists, we said, they do not have, um, they're not their own kingdom, right? Uh, because they, they really don't include all the descendants of the most common ancestor. So they have some uh, commonality between plants, fungi, and animals. So they don't have their own uh, kingdom, but they are considered a group. So they're not a monophyletic group, meaning they don't have um, all one common ancestor. They're considered a paraphyletic group, meaning they consist of several different evolutionary lines, not just uh, one evolutionary line. Okay, so protists are a little bit confusing because um, they have these different evolutionary lines. So they have some in common with the plant, they have some that are in common with the fungi, and some in common with anim in animals. Okay, so again, that's why we call them a group, or more specifically a paraphyletic group, because they have that multiple evolutionary um, lines, right? So they don't have kind of one common ancestor, they have a couple uh, ancestors, okay? So now let's get on to our friends, the prokaryotes. So both bacteria and archaea are considered prokaryotes. Now they're very similar superficially, so if you look at them structurally, um, they have differences and biochemically they're also very different as well. So you may think uh, that they are very similar, but they are uh, different, okay? So let's talk about some of those similarities and differences. So both can um, withstand extreme environments, okay? So here's an example of ones that are um, going to withstand very extreme environments. So first on the left hand side we have um, prokaryotes that are in Yellowstone National Park. Now these guys are withstanding temperatures of 185 degrees uh, Fahrenheit. So that's very very hot, right? So um, they're considered thermophiles because they can withstand all of that heat, okay? And then we do have some prokaryotes uh, in these salt ponds in San Francisco Bay. So this is 15 to 20 percent salt, okay? So very, very salty, not just like the ocean, but just very, very salty, okay? So you may say, okay, well maybe they're all bacteria or they're all archaea that can uh, survive these drastic environments, but uh, the ones in Yellowstone are a bacteria, so they're cyanobacteria, and the ones in San Francisco are archaea. So some are bacteria, some are uh, archaea. So different, right? So they can both withstand uh, some extreme environments. Not all bacteria are all archaea, but uh, some can, which is kind of cool.
So now classifying um, these organisms within each domain, it can be quite challenging. So within bacteria and archaea, it can be quite challenging. They're very small and they can be very uh, simple when we talk about their structure. And their structure can be very similar as well. So how do we classify them? Well, historically, we've kind of classified them by their shape, right? Are they round? Are they long? Um, are they squiggly? Uh, do they move, right? Locomotion. Uh, pigments, right? So what kind of pigmentation do they have? And what kind of energy requirements do they have? So that's how we've kind of classified them historically. But more recently, now that we can look at their DNA, we can reveal that our above um, classifications, what we looked at before historically, don't quite reflect their evolutionary history and maybe their evolutionary relationship. So that can be quite challenging as well. So we may not have been uh, quite correct in picking our uh, characteristics and our traits to look at. The other problem with these guys are that they can exchange a lot of DNA with each other and that can make it even more difficult, right? So if they're exchanging DNA, how do you figure out what DNA came from who and when and where? So that can be quite challenging as well. So just to kind of have an example, these are different bacteria on the right hand side and that's just showing the different shapes, sizes, uh, pigmentation, if they have flagella, which gives them locomotion, right? So some different uh, shapes and things that we use to classify them by and still do sometimes, right? So uh, we still use this to classify uh, different bacteria and archaea. So what are some common characteristics between uh, bacteria and archaea? So some are motile, meaning they have flagella, right? So it's kind of those little tail-like uh, whip structures that allows them to move. And these flagella um, are shaped a little bit differently than our eukaryotic cells, but functionally they do the same thing. Um, they have a lot of protective surfaces and they actually have what are called some protective endospores, meaning they protect themselves um, within this uh, spore and they protect their DNA. And then when the uh, environment maybe is favorable, the endospore uh, will break open and a new bacterium uh, will emerge when it's safe essentially, right? So they can last uh, or survive many, many years or even generations in this endospore state. Uh, and then they can emerge when maybe the environment is more favorable. They are specialized for very specific habitats. So we already talked about some of those specific habitats such as very hot, Right? So these thermophiles that uh, live in very hot environments or um, ones that really like salt, right? So things like that, um, and we'll see even more of them. So maybe different uh, heavy metals or gases or things like that that they use uh, for energy. So different uh, habitats, so they can be very specialized. And some even live in colonies, which we call biofilms. And so biofilms essentially are kind of a, um, a uh, like an environment for the bacteria. They create their own environment and uh, multiple bacteria can live together in a biofilm. So such as a plaque on our teeth are bi is a biofilm. So they can be, um, hard to break down. It's a protective uh, way for the bacteria to survive as well. So biofilms can be quite challenging and uh, even devastating sometimes um, in terms of trying to get rid of the bacteria. But it's protective for them, so it works for them. So most of them have um, one of these three shapes. Okay, so we talked about classifying them with their shapes. So usually they are one of these three shapes. So they can either be spherical, which we call coccus, 
okay? Or they can be kind of corkscrew shaped, which we call spirilla, okay? Or they can look kind of more like a rod. So they're longer than they are wide, and that's a bacillus, okay? So these are the three different kind of shapes or general common shapes of all prokaryotes. Okay, so then you can classify them uh, using these shapes. But again, we found out maybe they may or may not be more closely related within these shapes. So prokaryotes can really exhibit a very diverse metabolism as well. So what do they use for energy is what uh, that means, right? So do they use oxygen? Uh, do they not use oxygen? Uh, you know, we, our cells uh, use glucose, right? As energy as well. So do they use glucose or do they use maybe some other strange organic or non-organic um, molecule for energy? So some are what are considered anaerobic. So they don't need oxygen. Uh, so we are obviously aerobic. Our cells need oxygen, right? So these guys can be, some are considered anaerobic. Some can even switch back and forth between being aerobic and anaerobic, okay? So anaerobic ones, you can, can, you can think about what kind of environments maybe they live in, right? So these guys can cause a lot of infections um, in our body that, uh, where they can close themselves off and they don't need oxygen. So actually one of the treatments is providing them oxygen, which will kill them because they don't use oxygen. Right, so kind of interesting to think about. Um, two, some can metabolize inorganic molecules. So, um, you know, obviously we said we use sugar, right, or glucose as energy, but some like sulfur, maybe. Okay, so these are some examples. So the bottom left is our one of our anaerobic friends, which is Clostridium. So Clostridium is a bacteria uh, that can cause some pretty nasty infections. Um, and they close themselves off in abscesses because they create these abscesses where they uh, wall themselves off um, against the oxygen, okay? And then on the right hand side is a picture of some sulfur bacteria. So some bacteria that like to use sulfur um, for metabolism and for energy, which is quite interesting, right? So let's continue talking a little bit about these diverse metabolisms. So a lot of prokaryotes uh, use different forms of energy. So some other ones are going to use uh, light for energy, right? So they photosynthesize. So they're more like a plant, right? So they're green, right? Because they have all the chloroplasts in there. So an example of that would be cyanobacteria. So these guys uh, photosynthesize, so they use light uh, energy. Some are nitrogen fixing bacteria, so they use uh, nitrogen for energy. Okay, so these guys are fairly important um, in soil and in crops. So I have a little uh, video about nitrogen fixing bacteria uh, and why they're so important for things uh, like agriculture. And for some plants, uh, they use kind of a symbiotic relationship with these bacteria that fix the nitrogen for them. Okay, so all living things need nitrogen, but utilizing the nitrogen can be a challenge. And so if the bacteria can uh, fix nitrogen, meaning that it makes the nitrogen into something more usable for uh, the living organism, then that can be a helpful thing. So uh, watch the video, it's kind of cool. Some are uh, nature's recyclers, meaning that they use, um, you know, dead material or things like that. They're decomposers, right? So those guys are also fairly important as well in kind of the life cycle, right? And we'll talk about some major decomposers when we talk about fungi, right? So some bacteria will also do that. Um, and some are pathogenic, 
right? So again, we think about bacteria maybe as being all pathogenic, all bacteria are bad, right? They're all gonna cause infection or disease, but only 10% of prokaryotes are pathogenic. So that's a very small percent when you think about how many uh, bacteria and even archaea are out there in the world, right? So mostly we're talking about bacteria uh, when we're talking about pathogens. And that's gonna be our discussion this week is talking about some pathogenic bacteria that have caused um, some disasters uh, throughout history and caused some epidemics, okay? So we just said that most bacteria or prokaryotes are non-pathogenic, right? So they're not going to be bad, they're going to be good. So what can we actually use some of these prokaryotes for? What can they help us with? So there's a huge um, population of prokaryotes that can help with removing pollutants in our environment and we call this microbial bioremediation. So essentially they can help us remove things like pesticides and fertilizers um, which is great for agriculture and in the soil right so making the soil um, better and safer again right after using all of these pesticides and fertilizers so we can definitely use it in agriculture uh, we use it in water to remove a lot of toxic metals such as selenium and arsenic so there are some prokaryotes out there that will use selenium and arsenic as um, metabolic reagents right so then they'll take it up from the water or even in oil spills, and this is a big one, is that we can use bacteria to solubilize and degrade the oil in the water in the environment. So this has been huge for some of these uh, major oil spills in the environment. So this is great, right? So we can actually use some of these, um, you know, different metabolisms of these prokaryotes um, to help us, which is great. So microbial bioremediation is very cool and I highly recommend uh, looking into it more, right, if you're interested. So just like we said before that uh, humans do have some relationships with prokaryotes and we said only about 10% are pathogenic, meaning that they're actually going to harm us, right? So the majority of them are going to either have beneficial uh, relationship or just kind of a neutral relationship. And these are considered symbiotic relationships. So humans and prokaryotes can have either kind of a mutualistic or mutualism relationship or commensalism relationship. And so just to kind of look more into the pathogenic, right, this is an example of um, an, an auger with bacteria that has been plated on the auger. So anywhere where you see kind of a tan or yellowish area means that it has grown um, some bacteria. Right, so auger is just like a gel with some sugar and stuff in it to feed the bacteria, and so it'll grow. And then what happens is to test antibiotics, which are going to kill bacteria, and maybe it'll only kill certain types of bacteria, you place these little white discs with the bacteria onto the plate. And then you notice that there's some rings of clear uh, auger or clear gel around those antibiotic discs. And that means that that antibiotic has killed that type of bacteria. So this is how we test um, if our antibiotics are going to be um, effective against that type of bacteria. So if you notice, there are some discs that either have smaller uh, circles around them or maybe even not much of a circle at all. If you look at that kind of left, like at nine o'clock right there. Um, so that one wouldn't be very effective at all. So again, we only have um, very few bacteria that are actually uh, pathogenic, but luckily nowadays we do have antibiotics that are going to uh, kill most of that bacteria out there. But 
there is a bacteria versus antibiotic uh, warfare going out there as well because uh, the bacteria are evolving and adapting um, to be antibiotic resistant as well so that's kind of the scary part and we are not developing antibiotics or new antibiotics fast enough uh, to combat the um, the adaption or uh, adaptation and evolution of uh, bacteria so kind of scary but again the reality of uh, life so what are those relationships that are maybe beneficial so I've kind of added this into um, our lecture so go ahead and take some notes on it but um, a mutualistic relationship is where um, the individuals of different species are both uh, benefit okay so they benefit from the relationship and so for an example of this in humans we have a lot of bacteria that live within our gastrointestinal tract so these guys do a lot of things that help us out so not only are they getting nutrients but they're they can synthesize some vitamins um, and amino acids for us that we may not have been able to get otherwise they can also supply some essential nutrients um, all kinds of things they can even even aid in digestion and they can protect our uh, cells in our GI tract as well so there's lots of things that uh, they help our body with and so these are considered our good bacteria right so sometimes when you take antibiotics you kill off some of the good bacteria with the bad bacteria and so that's um, part of the problem with um, antibiotics and why sometimes you can get diarrhea with antibiotics because you're killing off all that good bacteria in the GI tract as well so a lot of people take um, probiotics prebiotics things like that that have that good bacteria in it or eat yogurt which has good bacteria in it as well so that's a mutualistic relate relationship or mutualism right where both parties are going to benefit and we'll talk more about mutualism um, when we talk about kind of relationship between species so our other type of symbiotic relationship is called commensalism so this is where two organisms um, are going to have a relationship but only one is really going to benefit but there's really no effect on the other organism there's no positive or real negative effect it's just kind of neutral and so for example for humans we actually have a lot of bacteria that live on our skin right and so the bacteria are actually consuming our dead our dead skin cells and you may think that that's uh, really disgusting right so there are some bacteria that are just fine right on our hands they don't really hurt us right if we consume them they're non-pathogenic but again we can have bacteria on our skin that are pathogenic as well which is why they recommend hand washing a lot of the times right because just by hand washing um, you can get rid of the majority of the bacteria on your hands so for example in this picture they've plated an auger before someone hand uh, washed their hands right so they have put their fingers on that um, the gel with all the bacteria sugar and stuff for the bacteria to grow so you can see those little colonies of yellow spots that are bacteria whereas if you just wash your hands and do the same thing you notice that there might be a few colonies um, of bacteria that are growing but nothing compared to uh, before hand washing so again this is really important for not only bacteria on our hands but also um, other pathogens as well especially these days we're talking about uh, COVID right So just to finish up with some fun stuff with these auger plates a lot of people do fun um, art and pictures with microbes because some of them are different color right so they can make these fun um, little auger art plates so if you want to check it out I've posted the video here as well as on canvas for you guys so until next time I'll see you guys later